So sitting on the table right here, I've got a computer I've been working on for a couple of hours now. I just wanted to run down the issue I've had with it and kind of kind of document it here. So anybody that is going through the same kind of problem can kind of see the steps to take. As you can see here, both of the sticks of RAM are in the same channel, even though I've got three channels and uh, six slots to put them in. None of the other slots actually work properly for some reason. I can only get it to run in single channel mode. I've gone through pretty much all the troubleshooting steps I can uh, think of and one that I can find online to go through. As of right now, it's only working in single channel, so I think it's just either a motherboard issue or a processor issue, and unfortunately the only other processors I have that I could slot into it and try it are in these computers here, and they are already up for auction, so I don't want to mess with them. We open up good old CPU-Z. All right, so we go over here to memory and we can look. There's eight gigs there. And we can also see it's in single channel mode, which, I mean, we already knew that just by looking at it. But if you didn't, you can always open up CPU-Z. It'll show you there if you're running in single channel, dual channel, or in this case, it would be triple channel if, uh, if it worked properly. All right, so now I did put it into triple channel mode. You can see there. All three sticks, all three channels are populated with one. And we'll go over to here, let's check out the properties. And right there is the problem. Installed RAM, 12 gigabytes and four gigabytes usable. One of the solutions here is to Windows R and go to msconfig. You wanna to go to your boot. This is, from what I understand, the most common solution to this problem. Advanced options on whatever, uh, whatever your default OS is there because sometimes you may have more options here if you uh, if you installed or like upgraded from, from an older version of Windows or something just go to advanced options uh, maximum memory it could be displaying a maximum there you can either set it to the amount that you've got or you can just uncheck it and by default it should already run at the amount of RAM that you have physically installed so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and restart it Yeah, and for whatever reason, this, uh, the way it's installed right now with the current BIOS that's on it, it'll actually kind of boot, boot loop like this a few times without uh, booting all the way into Windows as it's trying to recover the unusable RAM. And it usually takes like three times or so. It didn't actually do this before, the first time I tried this, but that was before I updated the BIOS to the latest. So something about the new BIOS is making it try a little harder to actually use all the RAM that's there and make it work properly. All right, so now that we're back at the desktop, we're gonna go back into our properties here. Let's see if it worked. And nope, we're still sitting at 12 gigabytes with only four usable. So, the next option is to update the BIOS. You'll basically just want to go to your web browser and find whatever the manufacturer's website is. You can, most of the time, you can just look on your motherboard. My model number is right in there. It's the GAX58A UD3R. Uh, I believe this is a revision 1.0. I don't remember where I saw that, but I swear it's on here somewhere. <laughs> Looked around for it earlier to try to double check and uh, couldn't find it. Uh, there's a revision 1.0 and a revision 2.0. I don't know if that makes a difference in BIOS support. Either way, you go to downloads. A lot of a lot of the manufacturers are set up just like this, or really similar. So these uh, instructions are kind of universal. You go down here to BIOS, and these are the different versions of the BIOS that have released. Here, all you gotta do is click download, which I've already downloaded from two to six, because these are uh, experimental BIOSes, is that what they're called? So, oh, I don't even have my flash drive plugged in. But I've already downloaded all these and put them on my flash drive. Handy dandy little flash drive. So mine are here. As you can see, these are all the, the BIOSes right there. This is just utility that goes with them. So now we will go to restart. 
Okay, so I forgot that I was going to get stuck in a boot loop for a few minutes with those uh, ram sticks there, so I just returned it to the uh, one working channel while I get this sorted out. Next step of the process is going to be to open up the flash utility after the post screen. There's our post. So now we're going to hit delete. Spam delete. So this motherboard, it only accepts input right now after the post screen goes away. So here we are, we're on our BIOS right now. I've looked everywhere through here and it doesn't show me the BIOS version that I have installed at the moment, but I can tell you it's F6 just because I put that on there earlier. So uh, right now we're gonna hit F8, go to our flash utility, yes. And uh, we're gonna update BIOS from drive. Come on now, drive. It shows my flash drive as a uh, hard drive for some reason, but there's all the uh, BIOSes right there. All you gotta do is click on the one you want and are you sure you want to update? Yeah, I'm already on F6. I'm already on the uh, latest one out of all these, so I'm not going to. But all you got to do is go in there, find your BIOS files. And uh, I have had motherboards before that required you to go in order, which is why I really wanted to know what BIOS I was starting with and just was disappointed that I couldn't find it. That's why I downloaded all the way from F2 to F6, just in case. But once I got here, I was kind of frustrated. I just said, screw it. So I just went straight to F6, and it worked just fine. But I have had one or two motherboards that have actually bricked entirely because I tried to go straight for the latest BIOS instead of updating one version at a time to the next one. So keep that in mind, especially with older motherboards. I actually think it was just uh, an issue of it being like an old motherboard that I was working with at the time. And uh, maybe it had some data rot going on, I'm not sure. But with that out of the way, yeah, I've already tried that. I'm gonna go ahead and shut down. Go ahead and show you what happens when I boot up in any of the other uh, channels here. Once again, I got the four lights. I think all that means is it's reading a uh, new RAM configuration and is trying to make it work. Save the settings to the CMOS. Still nothing. So this is basically where we're going to sit uh, if we use any of the other channels. I have actually gone through and tried all of them individually. And what happens is if we are in any of the channels other than the one all the way to the far left, that being the white or the blue slot from it, then it's just not gonna boot at all. But if I have it in either of the two slots on the far left, then it works just fine. And uh, as you saw before, if I have, say, all three channels populated, or essentially if I have any channel, if I have this one plus any of the other ones, it's gonna show up like it did the first time, where it's 12 gigabytes or however many I actually installed. And it's only going to show that the memory in this channel, these first two slots, uh, is usable. So uh, at this point, now that I've gone through all the steps, it uh, it's basically just a faulty motherboard or faulty CPU. And like I said before, the only processors I have are already tied up in other computers, and I'm not about to rip them out of there and mess with it. All right, I've got my two sticks back in place. The, the one poor little channel fully populated as it as it can be as it should be I'm gonna go ahead into my bio screen and uh, oh, I missed it okay. I'm gonna go ahead and spam delete this time so maybe I won't maybe I won't miss it it doesn't actually accept input until right after the screen goes away but it accepted it so quick with the new RAM configuration that it was just hard for me to catch okay so we're back here I'm gonna go to uh, where's it at I'm gonna go to Quick Boot, hit Enabled, just so we can get a nice little boost on our boot time here. All right, now that I've had a nice clean boot after saving the settings and resetting and everything again, I'm gonna go ahead and do a quick boot, boot test here. Let's just see how quickly it can boot into Windows. I always find it kind of impressive, the power of an SSD where all these components were made in like 2009. Yet it's not gonna take all day to get to the uh, the desktop here like, like it would if it had a hard drive in it. Yeah, 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 there we go. I've got a weird TV. You can see now that I'm on the desktop, it's already good to go ahead and start opening up programs here like a hard drive it would still be loading in everything and still be thinking about everything uh, 
That's just the glory of an SSD. So what I've got on the table here is an i7-950 under that nice Hypermaster 212 uh, Evo and a GTX 660. Um, new paste, obviously. I cleaned down the entire board with uh, alcohol and duster and all that stuff. Took, the, took the, uh, the graphics card apart, completely wiped it down, blew it all out, and actually um, took the, uh, the fans and washed them in the, the bathtub. I guess I can show that process next time I do it with the graphics card, but you can actually wash a lot of stuff, like uh, fans are pretty safe to just wash under water if they're really dusty like that one. It was particularly bad. Uh, you wash it under the, the immense pressure you get out of a, a, a bathtub, you know, and uh, It'll get all the dust out pretty quick. Just let it sit and dry for like 24 hours just to make sure there's uh, there's no water left in it by the time you go to actually put electricity through it next. Because that's the real problem. You don't want to get anything uh, spilled on it. You don't want to get any moisture in there when it's actually like turned on, when there's electricity going through it. But when there's no electricity going through the stuff, most of it's actually fine to just wash with water, believe it or not. Um, the CMOS battery in there, Right there behind the graphics card is the, with says KTS on it, it's reflective right there. That's the CMOS battery. Um, that's pretty much the only point on the motherboard that actually holds electricity constantly. And it does that because that's how it saves your uh, BIOS settings. So as long as you've removed that, uh, you're pretty much fine to wash it down. But apart from that, moving on to more of the components I've got here in the system, I've got a 120 gigabyte Toshiba SSD. Uh, it's so small because I bought it for like 18 bucks and you really can't beat that as far as the deal goes. Uh, we've got eight, uh, eight gigs of, once again, single channel RAM, as good as I can get it. And uh, yeah, we're gonna put it through some stress testing here so you can kind of see what the thermals look like on this system. Boiler alert, because it is a front mesh panel, the airflow is excellent. And not only is the front mesh, but the top is also mesh. You could add more fans there if you wanted to, but uh, I'm not going to bother with that. I like the way it looks, and the airflow is actually pretty good. So uh, let me put the side panel on real quick and uh, run some quick stress tests. All right, now I've got the lovely reflective side panel put on. Tempered glass, beautiful, a little smoke. Now we're going to run the uh, stress test on here. I'm going to open up hardware monitor first so we can get a glimpse at all of our temperatures. Right here you've got uh, processor and these are the temperatures of each core individually. And we're going to start with the, the graphics card down here, 660, and here's its temperature. So we're going to go and open up Furmark. You just click on GPU stress test and go. And what this is going to do is it's going to, it's going to essentially stress the graphics card. It's going to run, uh, it's going to run it at 100% utilization for an infinite amount of time. And see up here, it shows how long I've been running it, how many frames it's rendered. And uh, so I can I can just leave it here for hours if I wanted to, and it's just gonna keep going and going and going. And then down here, it's gonna show our uh, temperatures over time. It's gonna graph that for us. So I'm not gonna bother to, to run this for like hours and hours right now, because I've already done this test today. <laughs> I'm just showing you now uh, to show you what the process is. But uh, it ran earlier, it maxed out at about 62, which is great for the graphics card. Uh, it probably comes down to the, uh, the fresh cleaning and fresh thermal, thermal paste. And uh, it's, a, it's a two fan card and the case is pretty well ventilated actually. I'm really surprised <laughs> with how well ventilated the case is because it was only like 60, well, I, don't think, I don't think it was 60 bucks. I think it might've been 50. I don't know, I'd have to, I'll have to look it up here in a second. See, we do this, the temperature is just going to go up and up and up. And uh, you want to leave this for mm, you can you can leave it overnight if you want to. That's what a lot of people do. And uh, essentially, if you come back and this program is closed and you're just sitting on the desktop or something, that means it crashed and that can tell you that your card is unstable or maybe it overheated and actually caused your, your computer to shut off so that it wouldn't kill itself. Uh, most of the time, it's, it's it might black screen. You know if it gets too hot but uh i allowed it essentially to get up to uh, its max temperature earlier which i think it was uh 63 and it'll it'll usually bounce back by about a degree and by that point you can usually tell that it's already uh stabilized and it's not gonna get any hotter no matter how long you leave it there so i only had to do that for like 20 minutes before i uh could tell it's just totally stable 
So the next next test is going to be for the processor, and Furmark has a processor burner as well. So we just click here on CPU burner. Uh, by default, it's going to say how many threads your processor has. Just leave it at that. You don't want to do any less. There's no point. Hit start, and this is <laughs> it's the same as the other test where it's just going to run indefinitely. But this is this is what you have to look at instead of the uh, the nice fuzzy donut of death. We can go back over here to hardware monitor, and we can see here that it is running the processor at 100% capacity right now. And our temperatures, we are at 62 on our hottest core. And when I did this test earlier, I think it got up to, I want to say maybe 65. That's another test that we just already finished and don't really need to repeat today. But just for demonstration purposes, yeah, that's what we're looking at. Same concept here, if I uh, come back at any point and see that it's just like crashed to the desktop, I can tell that it just, it's, it's crashed or it, the processor's not stable or maybe it overheated or something and caused the computer to restart. Any of those things can happen. When you've got it settled all like this, then you know it's, it's good to go, then that's pretty much all you gotta do. Let's move on to see how well it can do some games, because uh, I'm a little concerned about the single channel RAM. Not gonna lie, but it's probably gonna do just fine. Um, the only game I can think of off the top of my head that really suffers from having a uh, single channel RAM instead of dual channel is GTA 5. And I'm not gonna be testing that here today anyway, so I've only got the 120 gig drive in there and it's probably not big enough for GTA anyway, so we're just gonna do a couple eSports titles. Here's a quick tip just to keep your computer running at its absolute fastest. By default, OneDrive is gonna run. Which, uh, if you use that, that's one thing, but I don't ever use it for anything. So I'm gonna go ahead and close that. Make sure there's nothing here in the test tray that's running that I don't want to run. <laughs> um, your feelings on antivirus software are going to vary person to person. I'm gonna go ahead and disable it on this computer, at least for the moment, while well, I'm gonna play some games on here, just because it'll allow it to run at full capacity without this doing anything. Also, you can hit uh, Control Shift Escape, bring up the Task Manager, and uh, go to your startup menu here. Just gonna go ahead and disable all this. Once again, I don't use OneDrive, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and leave it installed in case the future owner of this computer does. Now, this way, when I boot it up every time, it's not going to launch any of this stuff, it'll only be the desktop. For whatever reason, once I get Fortnite uh, launched, it <laughs> does just fine until it gets to this first screen here that says, uh, you know, best settings, yes or no. And uh, you can see it's frozen. And uh, this is full screen, so I shouldn't be seeing any of this down here. But uh, the computer's not frozen, it's just the game. I can still alt-tab and everything. It works just fine. And as you can see, the processor isn't really doing anything. So the game is just frozen. It's occasionally spiking there to uh, over 130 watts, which usually indicates it's trying to do something. I'm just gonna come back to this one later, and hopefully Rocket League won't have the same kind of problem there. Please don't make me do the tutorial. Oh my God. So this is a 720p TV, so obviously it's not going to stress the graphics card too much. But, um, you know, if you're buying a 660 in 2021, you're probably not too picky on your resolution. So let's go over to the video here. This is actually technically 684p, 1216 by 684 This is a very odd TV, and I have to uh, use NVIDIA's own scaler so that I can actually manually make it fit the screen or it won't properly. Uh, let's go ahead and pump up the SMAA as well. Beautiful. I'm only gonna drive with one hand in this tutorial here because I just can't be bothered to do the stupid tutorial again. But I'm seeing 100 FPS, 150 FPS in this thing, smooth. It, like all these arenas are exactly the same, so it's not like it's going to change from match to match. Yeah, no, I, it's doing this. It's doing this game just fine. This is like basically all I need to test with this game. 
I did go back and verified all the files through Epic, and as you can see, we're stuck on a different screen this time. So I don't know what it is. It's really not worth me spending a bunch of time on right now. I could probably just uh, uninstall it and re-download it and probably fix all the problem, or maybe spend a few hours on Google trying to figure out what my problem with Fortnite is. I really couldn't be bothered right now. I've got other stuff to do. Now here for CSGO, I've just got bots fighting against each other while I spectate. FPS is, um, fine, I guess. Sometimes up around, uh, over 110 and then sometimes bounces down to like 50 for a second. Sometimes hang out, hangs out around 80, which I was kind of hoping for more than that in this game, but, uh... Well, honestly, I was hoping for over a hundred basically most of the time, as you can see now, now that there's a bunch of people hanging out. We're in the 50s here. Which doesn't seem to ever go below 50. Oh, no, there's 47. Yeah, for a game like this, you're probably going to want a little bit better setting to that. It's probably the anti-aliasing, actually. that okay so we're back in now after turning off anti-aliasing it was cranked all the way up does look like it might be a little bit better at least on average now yeah maybe about the same I guess it's 684p or whatever this is it doesn't make much of a difference we're getting over 120 here 130 Depends on what our bot here is looking at. I'm gonna move on now to uh, something I should have done before I started this video, probably. Installing a good old Chinese Wi Fi slash Bluetooth adapter. I think this was like um, 15, 18 bucks, something like that. I've used a few in the past, uh, back when they were still like 12 bucks, and uh, they did just fine. So the I was using obviously a different brand back then. They had um, this one's got a metal cover on it too. I'm a little wary about that. Uh, the other brand had a, a much bigger metal cover on it, and I think inside was actually the uh, antenna for the Bluetooth was separate from the uh, internet antennas for whatever reason, and so I actually had to take the metal cover off for it to pick up the signal pretty well from the uh, controller I was using Bluetooth at the time otherwise it's just dropped connection all the time so uh, I'm gonna put that in there see how that goes these ones that have Bluetooth attached to them as well they have this uh, extra cable you get to plug into them this will go into an internal USB header and this other end will plug directly into the card went ahead and installed it in that top slot there and then Got the antennas put on, got it plugged up to the USB down there that you can't see. <laughs> uh, let's see if it works. I can see it a little better now. Windows Wi-Fi drivers tend to be good enough to uh, run the generic adapters like that, but occasionally it won't work and I'll have to actually uh, go figure out online what model that is that I just got from China and find a driver for it. So I'm kind of sitting here right now hoping that um, it's gonna take care of itself. I think what I'm gonna have to do is go in, plug the ethernet back up, and then see if it will download a driver for it. All right, Club Hub device manager is just not working. Now we can see that right there it is the uh, dual band wireless AC7265. So all we gotta do is go find a driver for it online, supposedly. Uh, looks like a simple driver fix did the trick. Now, we get to see if we can actually use it. It's loading everything okay. We need the Bluetooth software still. Of course I read 
and agree to all of it. That was pretty quick. All right. Here we've got our Bluetooth on and working now. I didn't even have to restart the computer for that. Let's see if we can get our controller paired. Turpin, Bluetooth. There's the controller. And it's connected. All right, cool. It all checks out. Overall, I've got to do. I've got to say, I do really like this cheap case. Surprised with how good the airflow is in it. I mean, I guess I shouldn't be surprised when it's got mesh freaking everywhere. But, uh, yeah. That's the i7-930 single channel RAM build. I was originally going to put a 1050Ti in here that's coming in in a couple days, but, uh, with it running in single channel, I just, just felt like it would be kind of wasted, you know? Gotta go with something a little more suitable for it.